every now and then we look at a story, and then we look at some common sense about it. In this first story here, there's a, there is some common sense to be, in these first two stories, there is some common sense to be raised. First off, the Supreme Court is weighing in on whether cities can punish homeless for camping in public spaces. Before that happened, three years ago, we here in Texas, there's a there was a law in House Bill 1945 called House called a uh, ban camping. It mean any homeless person will be prohibited from camping in any public place in parks without consent. Now the Supreme now this comes after in Oregon. So let's take a look. Court heard a major case about whether cities can crack down on homeless camps and punish people for sleeping outdoors. This case centers around a small city in Oregon that tried to block people from sleeping in public, even if they had nowhere else to go. A recent report by the federal government found that more than 650,000 people across the country were living in shelters or outside in tents and cars. NBC News Washington correspondent Yamichelle Sindor joins us now. Uh, Yamiche, it's good to see you this Monday. First off, what did we actually hear in those oral arguments today? Well, today the Supreme Court sounded skeptical of Oregon's case as the justices heard oral arguments on whether government laws punishing homeless people from camping on public property violate the Constitution and specifically the Eighth Amendment, which bars cruel and unusual punishment. Now, the ordinances in question were enacted by the city of Grants Pass, Oregon. They prohibit sleeping or camping on public property, including sleeping in a car in a city park. Now, a key issue in this case is punishment, which can include fines of up to several hundred dollars. People can also be barred from coming back to certain public properties. Um, today, both liberal and conservative justices posed a number of questions about how the laws could help curb hopelessness, which is what the city says they will do. Justice Brett Kavanaugh, who's a conservative, at one point said, if you get arrested for camping outside, how are you better off than you were before you got arrested? Now, lawyers for the homeless party, which sued the city, argued that the ordinances, in effect, criminalize homelessness and do nothing to improve the economic problems that cause people to have no place to go, Morgan. And Yamish, I mean, frankly, we've seen this before, right? Policing the homeless has become a, a pretty big legal fight in other cities as well. So how could this case sort of have implications for, for other states, other places that are looking at this as sort of the canary in the coal mine? Well, the Supreme Court decision here will have wide-reaching impact because a number of cities prohibit camping on public property. And local officials in several cities, including Los Angeles, San Francisco, and Phoenix, they all wrote into the Supreme Court in support of Grants Pass Oregon. But the Biden administration here has mostly backed the challengers, meaning the advocates for the homeless and their lawyers, saying that laws that bar sleeping on public property are unlawful if they are applied in a manner that prevents an individual without available shelter from residing in the jurisdiction. So definitely a case to watch and definitely one that's going to have impact. Yeah, Morgan? For sure. NBC News Washington correspondent and Michelle Sindor, thank you for information. Thanks for watching. If we raise some common sense, it would be, hey, you know, it shouldn't happen. It never should have happened. I mean, a lot of comments are saying, hey, we know, we now know the federal government has the money to fix the problem but it refuses. Here's an idea. Make housing negotiations affordable so people other than the rich can afford to live. Here in the state of Texas, there is a law prohibiting camping. That's section 48.05. We've focused on this before to where it's a Class C misdemeanor. A homeless person will not face jail time, but a fine of up to $500. No jail time, which is good, but it's state law. But city warrants will prohibit people from camping from sitting or sleeping on a sidewalk. It's to, I mean, we'll have that for you. We'll talk about that in just a few Due minutes. Due to the confidential name. But here's our next, here's our next story. It involves two suspensions. The superintendent and an athletic director. Do you think there's something fishy going on? Looks like we caught a live one. Here's Victoria. School board announced. In a unanimous decision, the school board announced Superintendent Tim Norman and Athletic Director Roger Masters will be on administrative leave with pay. The news causing confusion and upset among the community. 
all I heard was that they were going to be, I guess, suspended with pay, you know, and uh, and they, that was it. They really didn't say anything. Not what the cause was or what the case was, nothing. Here's what we do know. Tim Norman became Mathis ISD superintendent in February of 2022. He came from Hubbard ISD and had been an educator for over 20 years. Masters worked at that same school district as a head football coach and athletic director in 2020 and 2021. After that, he became the defensive coordinator with Mathis ISD and was named head coach in 2023. Several community members had shown up to the meeting, showing support for Masters. We just bend over backwards for these kids. Anything we need, he's there. Right now, the school district is looking to hire an outside firm to investigate both men. Due to the confidential nature of the investigation, the school district says it cannot provide additional details or comments on the matter. We'll be sure to keep you updated as we learn more. But it's still a mystery. We're going to have more about the homelessness in Oregon a bit later in this broadcast. Actually, we'll have that for you coming up next. And then later on, a story that would divine 2020 slogan, We're in touch, so you be in touch. Stay with us. A few minutes ago, we showed you, we showed you some, we showed you about the Supreme Court. We showed you what happened when next week the Supreme Court is going to weigh in about the decision to criminalize homelessness when they have nowhere else to go, which would violate constitutional rights. That's going to happen next week, and all, this all comes after in Oregon when they had a city ordinance preventing people from, from camping out in any public place, and would penal and would have people have homeless people arrested. With maximum amount of fines, Texas had a ban here in Texas. The ban can be bill, which is still put in place under Section forty eight point zero five of the Texas Penal Code. Feel free to write that down. Will prohibit people from camping in any public place without consent for an agency officer or an officer, including sidewalks. The city, City Corpus Christi, has made an ordinance prohibiting people from sitting. Or sleep or laying down on a sidewalk. And at the same time, the RTA, the Regional Transportation Authority, or the RTA here in Corpus, has put up bus bars to prevent people from laying down on the benches. Those are those benches are there to, are there to, to basically wait for the bus, not to hang out or sleep. So is it just cruel? Isn't it a good idea to punish homeless people, or is it just cruel? and to violate constitutional rights. Here's Devin Dreyer. On the banks of the Rogue River, tucked away under trees on the side of the road, even in center field of the local Little League ballpark, the homelessness epidemic is inescapable, even in sleepy Grants Pass, Oregon. Population 40,000, roughly 600 call parks like this one home. Brandon, a 38-year-old Grants Pass native, says he has no choice. So the city came in and said, you can't camp right there on those wood chips. They, yeah, yeah. The, uh, the, the officer said I was too close to the playground and I was too close to the, to the fence. Local law requires that he move his camp every 72 hours. The city had tried to ban camping in parks outright, but was blocked by a federal court for now. If I don't feel like I, just, I, I belong, I'm going to feel like an outsider and then I'm going to want to continue doing the same thing because there's no reason to, to thrive for anything different. There's no place to go. Helen Cruz knows the indignity yeah, firsthand. Yeah. Over five years living in parks before a nearby church took her in, she says she received more than $5,000 in camping related fines. I was holding down two jobs when I was out here and uh, still not enough to be able to rent a place. There, their uh, terms of low-income housing here is a thousand dollars a month and that's that's not workable either you know so when the police come through and they do a sweep of this area what do they do what do they tell you if you don't comply 
you are trespassed and you could possibly go to jail. The city of Grants Pass is among a growing number of American communities passing laws to crack down on homeless encampments. A perfect storm of skyrocketing housing prices, sunsetting COVID relief programs, a mental health and drug abuse crisis, and an aging population without retirement savings has led to record numbers of unhoused people nationwide. For all intents and purposes, a lot of the behavior you see here today uh, is illegal. And then our community will ask, well, what are you doing about it, Chief? Chief Warren Hensman says his officers are caught in the middle. We have community members in Grants Pass that are afraid to come to their parks. We've had shootings in our parks. We've had fights in our parks. Chronic drug abuse in our parks. So, so much of our citizenry are not walking through our parks. In 2013, the city passed an ordinance banning anyone from using a blanket, pillow, or cardboard box for protection from the elements while sleeping in public. Local Representative Dwayne Yunker says it was intended to crack down on unsanitary conditions and crime. Critics of Grants Pass say the, the council has tried to criminalize homelessness. Is that what's going on here? We do have a responsibility to keep people safe. And that's the struggle, it's how we keep everybody safe. Is it safe to have a kid play in the park where there's a tent 20 feet away? I don't know what the people in the tent are doing. But with no public shelters inside city limits, a group of homeless residents alleged the new law was cruel and unusual punishment. They sued in federal court and won. We're fighting between what the law is telling us and what the people want us to do and trying to make everybody happy. That's a big, huge struggle for us, the city government. Criminalizing the, the victims of our failed housing policy is morally wrong and it's unconstitutional and that's essentially what the city's the city of grants pass has done by making it illegal for someone to exist while being homeless i had a beautiful vegetable garden i love to cook laura a 55 year old grants pass native and mother of three says homelessness hit suddenly after her husband died in 2021 and health problems sent her to the hospital have you been ticketed by the city <laughs> yeah, um, I have over a dozen citations. What are the citations for? Um, mostly for scattering rubbish, and that means that uh, anything outside of your 8 foot by 8 foot diameter limits is considered rubbish, trash. Her home is now a tent in this park. I needed well, a little bit of color out here. here. A single daffodil, one small sign, Laura is clinging to hope. There's those of us that are struggling and fighting and taking one step out as we're digging out of the hole. <laughs> we have nowhere else to go. Yeah. Yeah. But across the river... You've got 78 beds in this building. Mm -hmm. It's only half full. Why is that? Uh, well, there's a lot of reasons. So this is what we call a 30-day dorm. Brian Boteller says the doors are open at the only private homeless shelter in town, the Grants Pass Gospel Rescue Mission. For over 40 years, it's provided warm beds and meals, but with religious requirements. How many times a day do they so go to chapel? Twice a day, our guys go to, go to chapel. They go to the chapel once in the morning, once in the evening. The Lord said, learn a lesson from this unjust judge. Residents must also quit smoking, drinking, and drug use, and give up their pets. The Ninth Circuit said that it's cruel and unusual punishment sure. on the part of Grants Pass to cite and fine some homeless folks for living in the park when there's nowhere else to go. Well, that's the part, that's the big question. Is there nowhere else to go? Is there just nowhere else that they want to go? Boteller says so long as courts say Grants Pass cannot ban camping in public, more people will choose to stay on the streets. We've seen a drop in our residency, and we've seen an increase in people in our parks and freeway overpass, underpasses and, and that kind of stuff in places where they ought not be. Cities from Phoenix to Los Angeles to Seattle have joined Grants Pass in appealing to the U.S. Supreme Court. These encampments in California are unacceptable. Elected officials from both parties urging the justices to make it easier for cities to clear tent encampments like these. It's not acceptable for anyone to call the streets or park their home. And cities need to have these ordinances so that they can help to incentivize people to accept offers of help. That's what these laws do. The reality is um, the only thing that works is more permanent, affordable 
housing. This case is not going to solve homelessness. If we prevail in this case, our homeless problem is still going to be there. It just means that we can't criminalize people while they're homeless. For Helen Cruz and Brandon, a lot is on the line. We're just a small little community with a really big homeless problem and no place to put us. Yeah, a problem Devin points out is all across this country. All across the country. And like I said, Texas, this state has has a banned camping bill. As I've showed you from www.statutes.capital.texas.gov, section 48.05 of the Texas Penal Code, you feel free to write that down, it prohibits camping in any public place without consent, including parks. The city of Corpus Christi has created ordinance prohibiting everybody from laying down or sitting on a sidewalk. And at the same time, the Regional Transportation Authority has put up bars to prevent people from laying down. And you tell someone they can't camp out here, where are you supposed to go? There are dozens of shelters here in Corpus Christi. And if you can't find one at this time of night, then you're on your own. I would recommend that if you find someone that says, where am I supposed to, if you ask, where am I supposed to go? You, you tell them the location of a shelter here in Corpus Christi. You, you either get the bus fare or say, you know what, get, get your stuff. I'm going to give you a ride to that shelter. We're going to take you there. This, this, that, and the third. We're going to help you out here. That law is put in place. To cut back on the population of homeless, not to or not to have people arrested. You can't jail the squatters, but you can jail the homeless. Because it's America, housing prices are ridiculously unaffordable. Very cruel cool punishment to prosecute the poorest among us. Why not make laws against corporations buying up subdivisions and reselling them at higher costs? Two jobs, she's still homeless. That is a crime. Her employer should be ashamed. We haven't built any shelters, but we got good cages. All we need for all here's what we need. We need programs. We need nonprofit organizations to come in and help out to solve the problem. But throwing them in jail, that's not gonna do anything. I'm not against the homeless. Or I'm not against I'm not I'm all about following the law. But I'm against throwing people throwing throwing the poor in jail. It's like we're better than you. So you can so you can go f yourself. You can go f yourself without better than you. It's like getting up on the high horse. Climb off up your high horse and start realizing that these people have nowhere else to go. I'm, I mean, I may be against the city. I may be against the Texas law. But why am I against? But again, I'm against throwing the homeless in jail. If we give the community service. I mean, it's a class C misdemeanor in the state, five hundred dollar fine. But if we get the community, if we, they say we don't have that kind of type of money, then we can throw in some community service, or an or a police officer could allow the one the homeless or homeless person to give homeless can give a homeless person a ride to a shelter nearby, here in Flower Bluff or here in Corpus. Fill out the paperwork, and you can go in and camp. That's it. That's helping them out. Instead of just punishing them, an officer can help out and give the person or person a ride to the shelter. That's helping out to, That's helping out your community. That way you can cut back on the homeless population. I'm not in favor of turning parks into homeless shelters, but where exactly should they go? How dare you be poor? You're under arrest. There are not vacant homes in America to give every homeless person three houses. This is a true fact. I went through it after a fire. It was hell and inhumane. I mean, it's the cost of living. It's because of what's going on. It's because of one city. But state laws could differ. And next week's Supreme Court ruling could affect Texas and every state that could 
Half a City Orange on band camping. So we'll keep you posted what's been going on. When we return, a story that will really touch your heart. As 2020 always says, we're in touch, so you be in touch. Stay with us. This is one of the first in seven years of this broadcast. We brought you inspiration and even a story that could even touch your heart. As 2020 always says, we're in touch, so you be in touch. The man you're going to meet tonight, he had a secret to tell his family. But how could he tell it to his family? 2020 went along. All about secrets and families. Could it be a medical issue? Or could it be something among, among the obvious? Here's Lynn Sure. Hey, his name is Jim Butcher. We have only just met him, but already we know more about him than his own family. At 33, Jim is gay and in the advanced stages of AIDS. What do you know about the course of your age right now? I know that I've um, had two infections. I know that um, I feel I still look somewhat healthy, but I know I have no immune system left. How much time do you think it's done? It's hard to say because you want to say years, but I, I have to say 18 months, two years is what I guess I really believe. With the end of his life in sight, Jim has decided to take an unusual step. He has invited 2020 to be witness to his story, a story that will be easier to understand once you know his family background. In the years since he left home for college and career, Jim has stayed in close touch with his family, regularly visiting his father, mother, and three sisters in Dallas. But those visits have been very painful to Jim. His family members are fundamentalist Christians who believe that homosexuality is a sin. So he hasn't told them about himself. Now, despite the risk of condemnation or rejection, Jim has decided the time has come to tell his family everything. He doesn't want to die a stranger to them. I want my folks to have the opportunity to participate in my life towards the end. I mean, I have the dreams of walking along the beaches with my folks at peace. And why couldn't you have done it sooner? The pain for them, it, it's, it's going to be incredible. We're using our alcohol passion. We are. Good job. Good job. Until last fall, a few months after Jim learned of his full-blown AIDS, he was able to hide his disease from his family. But then he had to have this catheter, which is checked once a week by a nurse at his home in St. Louis, surgically implanted. I need to get myself daily intravenous infusions of a drug and have a catheter in my chest and to hang out, and that would be very difficult, if not impossible, to do in the I have to tell him now, uh, if I never see him again. You've heard stories, I'm sure, of people with AIDS being abandoned by their families who couldn't handle it. Are you concerned that that might happen to you? No. No. They can never do that. They could never abandon other children. It's just not within them. Yeah. So you really believe your folks are going to come through? Mm -hmm. Oh, not necessarily. It's going to be a clash in the two worlds. Jim's world and the world of his family were not always in such conflict. He remembers growing up in a loving household, living all over the country while his father served in the Air Force. They even spent two years in Iceland. So your memories of childhood are obviously very happy ones. Oh, they're incredible, yeah. We had a lot of fun. It was great. When Jim was a child, his entire family was born again and became part of the charismatic Christian movement. There was a, a pretty much of an understanding that homosexuality was kind of the worst of all sins, the lowest of the low, that it was a choice people made. If you participated in that thing, you were going to hell. For many years, Jim shared this belief, even deciding to study for a career as a fundamentalist minister. My hero, like 12 or 16, was Jimmy Swagger. You know, I would go and hear him, and I, oh, I'm going to be Jimmy Swagger. 
Did you use this process to be like Mrs. Oh, Bucket? yes, yes. Can you give me an example? <laughs> Come on, show me what you have. Show me how you would have done it. Oh, if I could think of the right words, but uh, I would walk back and forth in the bedroom, and hopefully no one was home, you know, and, and just, you must be born again and repent from your sin, and walk back and forth, and kind of really get into it. Did you think you had a mission to do this? A calling? Oh, absolutely. I was called of God. I've been called into the ministry. That was a big thing for me. And my mom was very proud of that. But at Trinity Bible Institute in North Dakota, as an honor student preparing for the ministry, Jim was waging a wrenching private struggle over his sexual identity. As a teen, he had begun to develop a secret world because of something that shocked even himself. Jim was attracted not to girls, but to other guys. I mean, it's the worst possible thing. And I, and I just, I didn't want to know that. I didn't want to believe that. And I would just keep shoving that down into that closet. That was within me. Jim considered his secret temporary because fundamentalist Christians teach that homosexuals can change. Did you really believe that you could change? Oh, absolutely. And well, they told me I did. And that was my goal. I could be cured. I could get rid of it. And so for years he prayed, most desperately at the Bible Institute. Night after night, I would wait till late, like midnight or one, when I knew no one was in the prayer room downstairs. And we just uh, cry out to God for change. And for hours, begging God, and then we fast. And I try to go periods without eating, uh, up to a week. Can you remember any of the prayers you did? Yeah, some of them I do. Um, you know, take this evil away from me. I really want to be close to you. Please change me, God. Please help me. And, uh, no answer. So at the end of college, he quietly said goodbye to the ministry. It was a silent yet crushing fall from grace. Okay, well, where's everybody at? I'll be on In 1984, Jim took a job in Houston as a sales rep for Southwestern Bell, the company he is still working for when we visit. Now his secret world took on a new reality. He began to spend time in the gay world to date men, and slowly he began to feel some peace. I remember the very first dinner party where it was all gay men and, uh, and the closet was open and I could be Jim, which was a wonderful freedom. I remember thinking this is, this is the best thing that ever happened to me. In time, Jim came to believe that homosexuality is not a sin. Eventually, he moved in with a boyfriend, Al, but kept this world hidden from his family. We have some phone lines, um, so his mom only had that number. And he was always constantly worried about what was going to be said. Um, he was worried that I was going to answer that phone sometimes. What were you so afraid of? I was afraid, you know, afraid they totally ostracized me. It was a, just a, a, a panic, freaking fear within me. They would ever find out. During these years, Jim continued to see his family, but discouraged any questions about his private life. It must have been so painful for you to, to put up this wall between yourself and the family. Oh, it's been the, the worst thing in my life. The hardest thing, the most difficult thing. One of the loneliest moments came in 1986, when Jim learned he was HIV positive and agonized that he couldn't tell his family. Especially when, when the realization came along and said, um, unless somebody did some real fast research, that you know, I'm going to die. known his secret. Over the years, she's gone home with Jim so often to visit his parents, she's almost part of the family. They met 10 years ago at work. We just clicked and he just became our little friend. <laughs> Were you ever romantic about? Oh, no. No. Bonnie says she knew right off that Jim was gay. And she became something very important, a vital link between the two worlds. And tomorrow, she'll be running around like nothing happened. Their friendship has run the gamut, from the frivolous, Bonnie's dog is the daughter of Jim's dog, to the most serious. Is there anything else that he could be doing? Jim has granted Bonnie power of attorney over his medical care. You just finish the bathroom out like we talked about, and then you can drop yourself back to one twice daily. Describe to me what she needs to you. Her love and her companionship have been the greatest gift. Yeah. Mike's. Me. She's the one who 
one driving force in my life that uh, got me through all this. It is Bonnie who will travel to Dallas to break the news to Jim's family. She volunteered for the job, agreeing to deliver a letter he wrote, a 15-page revelation which abolishes every secret and asks his family for their love and help. Dearest Dad, Mom, Debbie, Cindy, and Karen, this is without a doubt uh, the most difficult letter I will ever have to write, and most unfortunately, it will probably be the most difficult you will ever have to read. First, the one thing I need to make very clear is how much I love you all, and I never ever wanted to hurt you in this manner. I am gay, and I do have AIDS. Because of your own religious convictions, I wish I never would have to tell you this. Do you think it's fair to your parents at such a truly horrible moment that, that you're sending a messenger in a letter rather than being there by yourself? Uh, maybe not. Um, maybe not, but it's the only way I can. If I did it in person, the reactions obviously would be strong, and um, I think the conversation would be too intense for either of us. There's another crucial facet to this delicate plan. Bonnie will invite Jim's parents to meet him in Seattle one week later. He hopes that the beauty of the Pacific Northwest will help start a reconciliation, if they agree to go. What are your highest hopes for this whole thing? I guess what I hope most is that they expect the, uh, the tickets to go to Seattle. And long term, the expectations they come to, to accept and love me. Jim's most passionate wish is that his family will set aside religious teachings and accept his belief that homosexuality is not a choice. Do you want them to come out and say, it's okay that you're gay? I don't even care if they say that. I want them to say, yes, we understand you were created that way. Why are you choosing to do it on national television? I don't think it's fair that um, men are going to the grave like, like, like with puppies with a tail between their legs, so ashamed of the way they're dying. And I want to make a difference, and I feel a calling in my life to do that. It almost sounds in, a, in an ironic sort of way that this is the ministry that, that you were called to. You know, I thought that so many times. I thought that so many times. And, and cause I never lost that sense of uh, Jim, go out, make a difference. And, and this time I'm able to do it with such conviction and such a, and such a real true belief. You're the air car? The picture, yeah. And this? Yeah. It is Friday morning. The time has arrived for Jim and Bonnie to pack for the trip from St. Louis that will change an entire family's life forever. Great. Bonnie will fly to Dallas to break the news tonight. Jim will sit out the suspense in Kansas City, his former home with Al, where he still has a wide circle of friends. He says he'll need all the support he can get in the next few days because this brief trip will end nearly a lifetime of hiding. Okay, I'm recording on. At the airport, during an excruciating delay, Jim anxiously goes over the letter one last time. Finally, the plane is ready to board. I heard the thought, this is it. We say goodbye to her, and there's no turning back. And then he pulls the boat. I do wish you well, Bonnie. Thank you so much. Right. I love you so much. I remember hugging her. My heart was so full for Bonnie. And uh, you've been so wonderful to this. Thank you. Take care. I know she's the help with me. Of not only me, but of my face. It is 6.30 p.m. In less than three hours, Jim Butcher's family will know who he really is. And in six seconds from now, what will the family, how will the family act? when Jim tells his family that horrifying secret. When we return, the dramatic conclusion to this story. How will the family react? And what is Jim doing now? Stay with us. Returning to our, now the conclusion to our story. What if your child would come out to you and say, what if you were a child and you went to your mom or dad and say, mom, dad, I think I'm gay. 
How would your how would your mom and dad react when they say, "Oh my God, I can't believe it," or "It's all right, I'll be I'll be supportive of what you do no matter what." But how would you feel about going on a talk show or a national television to breaking the secret? Like most talk shows, would like reveal secrets saying. I'm not really a man, I'm a woman, or a gene on your husband, or this child may not be yours. But for Jim Butcher, his secret would either do two things. Number one, to the family important. Number two, make the family understand. But the question is, how is the family going to react to Jim's secret? Here's Lynn Sure with the groundbreaking conclusion to our story. <laughs> Friday evening, Kansas City. While Jim Butcher's family learns the truth about him in Dallas, he spends a tense evening with friends who are here to support him. Well, I can only say I've been nervous, uh, <laughs> maybe nervous to rank on it because this is, um, this is the most important weekend of my life. Eerily, just at the moment Bonnie is supposed to be reading the letter, Jim bursts into tears. An hour later, he is still in agony. I know my mom is my dad and my sister are sobbing at this very moment, and I know they're crying, and I, and I want them to know. I want them to know how much I care. I want them to know how much I love them and how I never wanted this. I never wanted this. I never wanted to hurt them. The next morning at a trend Al's house, Jim still doesn't know how it's going in Dallas. He isn't expecting a call here because, concerned that the shock might lead them to blurt out something they'd regret, he's arranged for his folks to leave messages on his office machine. Later that day, he calls in. You know, my heart was pumping and racing. And I guess I cried quite a bit, but I think that was from happiness. Jim, this is Dad. Pal, I love you. You're my son, Jim. I'm real proud of you. We'll get through this together, buddy. I sure love you. Jim's father has come through. Now it seems safe to call home. His mother answered. She said she loved me. She said, yes, we'll meet you in Seattle. So far, Jim's delicate plan is working. We have seven minutes. Uh -oh. A few hours later, he and Al go to the airport to meet Bonnie's flight from Dallas. Jim can barely wait to hear her version of his family's reaction. Oh, yeah. I just thought, Jim, it was over it's done they know oh my god oh don't cry bonnie i was so tired and i was so i was just upset delivering this message was by far the hardest most difficult thing i've ever done in my life okay a few minutes later bonnie's exhaustion gives way to exhilaration as she eagerly delivers presents from Jim's sister. Wonderful. Jim's youngest sister, Kim, has written him a letter. If we only have six months or six years, I want to know my brother, you know, Kim. But for all the good signs, Jim is still nervous, still uneasy about what will happen when he sees his parents in Seattle at the end of the week. How will they ever bridge the enormous differences in their beliefs? And there's a more immediate concern. You think they're going to be in acceptable health together? It changes day to day, so I hope so. And if I'm not, I'm going anyway. <laughs> Nothing would keep any of them away now. Mary and Fred Butcher arrive in Seattle first, and they try to get through the day. But they're not here to see the sight. It's tough. There'll probably be a day that we won't have them anymore. And knowing this, you know, I just want to squeeze every moment that we can into just having him with us. Jim's parents, who have agreed to talk with us because it's Jim's wish, tell me what they've been going through. How startling it was when they heard the truth from Bonnie. When she got to the part of the letter, where Jim told you he was gay and he had AIDS. It must have been just such a shock to you. I, I think I said, oh, 
don't know. N n not this. I would say it was the darkest moment of my life, really. I can't remember when I've ever cried like that. I just felt so hurt for Jim. To say we're not disappointed in this would be a lie. To say we're not crushed by it would be a lie. But our hearts are broken because of the struggle he's having, because of the pain he's having. But Mary and Fred have not changed their religious conviction that homosexuality is a sin. To my way of thinking, the mistake that Jim has made, okay, it's got a heavy, heavy price tag. But that doesn't stop our love. Well, are you concerned about what's going to happen to him? Because he has sinned? It does concern me. I mean, he has to make things right with God. We believe it's a very literal hell, just like we believe it's a, a very literal heaven. Because the Bible teaches that. But I cannot judge a person. Still, Jim's letter has caused Fred to see a new side to the question of whether homosexuals choose to be gay. If I read Jim's story to me right, he didn't want this. He never has. I've never seen this before. I always thought, well, if you think you say this, but Jim is sincere, and I don't really know. Fred also regrets that his own hostility towards homosexuality caused them precious time. If I hadn't been so cold and callous towards this issue, Jim might have, just might have talked to me about it, talked to my wife about it, and just maybe, just maybe things would have worked out differently. Maybe in the days to follow, we talk and, and share each other's thoughts. That's what I'm hoping for. When Jim and Bonnie finally arrive that evening, they are both eager and wary. Uh, I was really apprehensive to see them face to face. It was almost like what I'd heard throughout the week might not be true. I am, my stomach is just full of butterflies. I don't know. I just feel sore. It's just, wow. You have to knock. Christmas and the cookies. 
Mm, and the decorations. Oh, oh man, I that thanks, Bruno. At this point, it's not really what's right or wrong. It's happened. He has age. If I come up to him and say, oh, Jim, that's wrong, that's wrong. I'd be injuring, I'd be hurting him. We have to love him, we have to support him. It is one thing to love your son, quite another to accept everything about him. Theirs is an uneasy piece. Especially evident when Mary explains why she thinks homosexuals get AIDS. In the scripture, any misuse of sex the way God intended it to be used has consequences. Um, we could be missed down through the years. Jim, I guess he doesn't agree with you on that. That's all right. That's all right. Is that all right with you, Jim? Mm-hmm. If she doesn't agree with you, that's okay. For now, I'll give me time. <laughs> We'll have our loving debate, won't we, Jim? Yes, we Jim, what's it meant to you this weekend? They surprised me incredibly. Mom and I had times we connected. But, um, with my dad, I felt like his heart was screaming out for me this week. I love you, I love you, I love you. I've never heard that before. great. I've never felt more loved. I've grown so close to Jim this week, and I've said, I've been stuck this all along. I really feel that I've fallen short of what Jim, Jim wanted me to be, uh, but I feel so great about Jim. And, uh, and I said, boy, I, I've missed it. Do you know the song, The Last Song, by Elton John? It's a song where she talks about, um, uh, what the line is, um, I never knew the love between father and son is so great, and, um, I remember hearing it all the time, thinking, gosh, I wish that was true, but that will never happen. You can do it. Me, yeah. I mean, it's like that song came true.
we've done a lot of sad stories, but this won't even take this won't even take was this won't take the cake after seven years. So, as you know, what uh, Cameron Mitch from Modern Family. I mean, we're gonna have stories about AIDS next week and homosexuality and AIDS probably don't mix, but we'll look deeper in it as it goes. All right, we're going to take a break. We'll be right back. If there was a slogan saying, don't you try this at home, this helicopter video would even, would even point that out. See if you can spot a laser. Did you see that? We're going to pause it again. Even a split second if I were to slow it down a bit. Right there. You see that laser? That little circle dot? That laser is what happened to a teen in Florida. The teen fate is is facing felony charges for pointing a laser at a sheriff's office helicopter. When people say don't try this at home, definitely don't try it in Florida. Take a look. Don't try this at home, kids. A teenager is in big trouble with the law after police say he pointed a green laser at a sheriff's office helicopter. The act is considered a felony in Florida. You know why you're in the back of a car and handcuffs? Because I'll put a flashlight in the helicopter. This is video of the incident in Pinellas County. You can hear the reported complaints of being blinded by the light. I'm a subject on 7th Street Northwest and 15th Ave Northwest who keeps hitting us with a green laser. Get up and get somebody on this gentleman. Uh, he keeps blinding our pilot. Deputies later caught up with the team and he was taken into custody. Is your laser at in your pants pocket? No, bro, bro. Just lick it off, bro. Lick it off that You know why you're in the back of the car and handcuffs? Yeah. Why? Because I'll put a flashlight in the helicopter. Okay. I know the police helicopter, yeah. It was. The 13-year-old later told authorities that he did it because he was bored. This is Inside Edition Digital. I'm bored. Mira, Colón. You're bored? Get a newspaper and kill the flies. Hey, man, I'm bored. What do you want to go do? Hey, let's point a laser light at a helicopter. Ah, my eye, my eye. I can't sing, I can't sing. We're going down, we're going down, man, we're going down. <laughs> There's nothing funny about that. It's a felony to be doing something like this. Bodily harm to an officer, that's a very serious charge. Very serious. Alright. We're going to do one more, then we're going to do... All right. <clears throat> Is the TSA... Here's the thing. Could you avoid traffic tickets? Here's how you can avoid traffic tickets. These are the top three ways to beat a speeding ticket. And number three, just don't pay it. Excuse me, you have to pay it. Why? Because I said so. Nope. Paying the ticket would be an admission of guilt, so if you plan on fighting it, don't do that. Number two, and this is important, while you're calling about your ticket, ask about your court date, and then request to change it. Yeah, Monday's no good. Thursday, 7 a.m.? Yeah, whatever. Cops often plan all their court dates on the same day, so you requesting the change could make it more likely that the cop doesn't show up. I'm here, Your Honor. I see, but where is... But what? I had court today? I never have court on Thursdays. And if the cop's a no-show, that makes it more likely the judge rules in your favor. <sighs> Sorry I'm late. Oh, no, it's you. And number one, if the officer does make it to court, it's time to challenge their observations. Yeah, I clocked him speeding, caught him with a radar gun and everything. Fun fact, radar guns usually need to be calibrated every 30 to 60 days. Ask the officer, say, when was the last time you calibrated that thing? What? Wait, you calibrated it, right? <laughs> yeah, of course I, yeah, whatever, yeah. No, I didn't calibrate it. Jeez, man, get your shit together. These are the top three ways to beat a speeding ticket. And number three, just don't pay it. Yeah, if you, you can really change your schedule. So yeah, 
if you feel like just sit there and say, hey, this is no good for me because I gotta work that day. I'm off Wednesday, so I can definitely go. So I can definitely go go to court on this day. If you do that, then maybe then it'll be understandable and say, okay, well, this, this, that, and the other. If some states won't do that, then you gotta, you gotta go to court. You gotta go to traffic court on that day. But the bottom line here is this: you're speeding. You gotta go to court. That's your bottom line. You can find in court, and what pot will be held against you? Held against you. Back in a moment with our viral break and tonight's body cam break. Stay with us. Oh, here we go. Uploads for fun again. What are they up to now? Two videos. Well, here's some Marvel pickup lines that you probably never would say. Pickup lines you should never say. They call me the mom. I'm big, green, and I get smaller if we wait too long to smash. I've seen worse. Sorry. Oh. I am Iron Man. I got a giant rocket in my underpants. Dude, you're embarrassing me. I'm Captain America. I don't use the F word often, but I love to fuck, 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 f
Mm. And I realized she's just missing. She just doesn't know her mom. And that's our problem. We've got a little girl inside. Her name is... Mom's name is Victoria. Um, I've tried calling her mom several times. I've actually tried asking her last names and going on Facebook and finding, maybe trying to find mutual friends. I've tried everything, guys. What's the, how'd you get the phone number? She's actually a regular here. She actually used to work here a long time ago. The girl's mom. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, but that's, that's, that's it. Gotcha. But, I mean, I, I, have, I have tried everything. You have a you guys, I don't. Okay. Uh, you don't have a last name? No. Okay. I think probably the little girl does. I I, I think I I had the guy's last name. I have a, a solid phone number, so I didn't ask for the last name. Okay. All right. Can I have your names? Huh? Yeah. Chris. Uh -huh. Chris. 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 Who's the who's the one talking to? Oh, I'm talking to her. Matt. Chris. Chris. Where's uh? She turned the, the lights off every single one. Okay. okay. But you don't remember which way she walked when she mm -hmm. left the car? No. Okay. Okay, so we want to thank Morgan and Morgan for sponsoring this video. I think it's pretty clear from the stories that we... Campfire. So the campfire was there? 
when you first got here? Um, yeah. Okay. But there was only a little bit of it. I gotcha. Were you able to see the people around the campfire? No. No? The bus was blocking it. The bus was blocking it. Okie dogs. <laughs> You're doing so good. You're if she good. walked down here, she would never leave me. Because this, she's never done anything like this before. But, yeah. but that's blocked off, so she can't go that way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 10 minutes and then I found Sky Dive the way and I heard people talking and I followed it and I went inside. Okay. You came to hang out with us, right? <laughs> because the car was off. Like completely yeah. off. That's good. Power, maybe? Mm -hmm. Okay. You thinking more than an hour or less than an hour? No, I think like around an hour. Okay. I don't I don't think it was a ton more than that, right around an hour for yeah. sure. We got her some food, and then it was kind of like... Yeah, she was looking good. What do we do? <laughs> <laughs> good thing you called. <laughs> Thank you. You doing good? Mm-hmm. Okay. You want to hold my hand still? Okay. <laughs> um, she has a purse that goes around here, and it's like, um, container. And then she wears it. Right, mostly around here or here, mm -hmm. and then she has her phone in it, but she didn't bring her phone, right? Mm -hmm. What no, color was her right shirt, there. maybe? Do you or know what, what was like, it, like pink, purple? Like long sleeve or what? Long sleeve white? Long sleeve white? Was she wearing pants? Um, no. No? What was she wearing? Um, she was wearing a long sleeve shirt, mm -hmm. and then she wore, um, she wore some shorts. Or some shorts? shorts? Like shorts like me? Um, yeah. Like this? Like yeah. little shorts, tight yeah. shorts. Yeah. Okay, and a long sleeve white I know, shirt. I know when it's all clear because we you know. You know. Okay. Do you Six thirty in the morning, right? I, I do not. And you realize that your daughter, at seven, yes. seven years old, has been by herself with us for four, I do not. for four hours. I do not. You, know, you know, you understand my frustration with this whole situation, right? What on God's green earth were you doing that your daughter is here by herself? at seven years old, where she's terrified and goes into the bar and asks random bar people to help and call the police. I have no idea, I'm sorry. So, sorry, he ain't gonna cut it. She said she was in a car somewhere over there. Can you show us? Yes, Who's in that car? And go hang out. Can you guys come? Yeah. We're in the car alone? So, wait, do you want in the car alone? Yes. Who's car? I have no idea. Why are you in someone's car and you don't even know? I have, I have no idea. You understand how this works, right? I do. What's your brother's uh, choice? My, my third choice is alcohol, but like I, I, I don't know how I ended up in the car. I just woke up in the car. Honestly. How'd you end up here? Um, I I came here to meet friends. Yeah. So like all I all I know is I, I came here to meet friends. Um, and then I I went <coughs> in the car. Yeah, the mom. I, I came here to meet my friend mom, and then I woke up in that car. That's all I know. 
I, I, I really didn't mean to leave my seven year old alone in the car. I would never do such a thing. I mean, her, her, her dad died last year. He was murdered. He was stabbed in, 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 the, in, the, in the heart. Um, like, I would never try to leave my seven year old alone. So, when you met your friends here, Renan? Yes. When you met Renan here, did you go into the bar? Yes. Okay. Did you have a drink? Yes. What was the last thing you remember? The last thing I remember is me and my friend were not here and then having a drink and I'm just fit. But, like, I mean, I'm not an alcoholic. You know, I know mean? like, I, I, I can hold my drink. Like, I'm, I'm 35 years old. You know what I mean? Like, it was probably like my third drink. You know what I mean? So, um,. It shouldn't have knocked me out, but you I don't know why I was in that car. Now, I'm not a woman, and I don't know how things are. Do you feel like maybe you were violated in any way? I don't know, like, I woke up in a car that wasn't mine. I woke up in a situation where I, I didn't know where I was at. Um, were your clothes on? My clothes were on, yes. Um, because we're buttons, yes. Um, but um, I don't know how I ended up like this. You know what I mean? Like, it, 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 I shouldn't have ended up like this. I've, I've never been in this. Oh, you're right. Like I should have ended up like this. Right. Right. Also, probably shouldn't have come up here with your seven year old. Right. Well, I just came up here to, to, to say hi to my friend, have a drink, and then leave. But, so, like, obviously, it didn't go out that way. You know what I mean? So, so you like you had three drinks? Yes. What is it that you drink? Um, I drink beer. Yes. So I had two beers um, before I came here. I mean, I had a beer when I died. So, yeah. I, I don't know how I got from two beers before here and then one beer here. I had one beer before <laughs> here. When's the last time you saw Renan? Um, uh, I mean, obviously it's been several hours. Like, were you sitting at the bar together, and then the next thing you know, you're waking up in the car, well, or no, like, you um, go to the bathroom? Like, I don't, I don't remember anything from tonight. Like, like this is what I'm getting at. It's like, um, like, tonight is very hazy. Like, as far as being here, I don't know. You mm -hmm. getting here. Yeah. I mean, yeah, in a sense, we yeah, all had to be you know what I mean? But, other than that, no. Well, you stated that you came here to meet friends. And yes. And you remember yeah, I came going to, to the bar, so you do remember coming here. Yes. Yes. So let's yes. be honest, okay? Uh, yeah, I'm... That's going to be the best yeah. way for this situation. Okay, yeah. because you just left your seven-year-old daughter alone for six hours. Right. You understand that, right? I understand so that. So let's be honest with us. When we ask you questions, you answer them completely and truthfully. Alright? Alright. So after you left the bar, what happened? Not after I left the bar, after I left city limits. Um, after you left city limits? Yes. Tonight? Yes. When were you at city limits tonight? Before they came here. Yes. Before, before they came here? Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, I met my friend Renan here. And then... I, I got know. it. Is Renan a male or female? A male. Will you talk to me, Renan? Okay. Okay. So, <clears throat> um, with, uh, you don't remember, you don't remember leaving at all, like, from here? No. Okay. Um, how long have you known Renan? Um, probably for, like, I would say four to five months. What's your guys' relationship? We're friends. Do you guys hook up, make out, do any of that? Uh, yes. Casual benefits? Yeah. Um, <laughs> excuse me. Um, so, the very last thing you remember, do you remember where you were standing over here? No. No? Um, so, what's your, what's your last memory at this bar? Do you, like, Location, like from inside, outside. I remember coming to the bar and getting it on. So you just remember showing up and then yeah. it was done. 
How much did you have to drink before you came here? Uh, two beers. Two beers? Any mm -hmm. prescription drugs? No. Uh, well, suboxone, yes. You took suboxone? Yes. How much you take? Um, one strip a day. Okay. You didn't take anything else? No. Was it prescribed? Yeah. So, with your, what, what kind of beer was it that you drank? Um, it was, I would say the equivalent to the England. The England? So, um, was it a draft bottle? Draft. Draft, okay. Um, aside from, obviously, what you're telling us is you don't remember, all you remember showing up moving on, and then that's it from here. Um, who, besides your daughter, were you at City Limits with? Okay. Just your daughter? You guys were, were having dinner with anybody else or anything like that? No, sir. Okay. Um, all right. Um, <coughs> so, you don't know. Renan, was it out here or was it inside? It was inside. And he was already here waiting on you? Yes, he was already here. Did he have your beer waiting for you when you got here? No. Or you ordered it when you got here? That was that one guy. And then from the time that you got here, <coughs> did you ever leave that beer unintended? Like go to the Absolutely. bathroom or do whatever? Yeah. Yes, sir. Yes. Simply yes. I lived here my whole life. I'm very, very old. I grew up in the um, This is the place that I trust. Um, yeah. Have you ever used in the past? I have um, I'm an ex IVI, um, but uh, I've been sober now from IV drugs for five years. When was the last time you used? It's been five years. It's been five years? Mm -hmm. So you didn't do back in January? January? Of this year? That there's a Volusia County Sheriff's Office report about? Yes, I have heard it. Okay, so the last time you used was January? Yes. Okay, so again, I don't understand why we're lying. Because a lot of, a lot of these things we're asking you, we we know some of the answers to. We're trying right, to. But the behavior, the, the behavior that I've done, but, but it's five years ago. We're not talking about the behavior, right. we're talking right. about your actions. I understand. Right. So, I understand. So you can see where the level of distrust is. Right. Right. Because, okay. you know, we're not, we're not okay. kids in the block. I mean, he kind of is, but he's, he's smarter than right. Could, right? Okay. So, we're not fucking around here. Because right. a seven-year-old was left by herself to walk into a bar of strangers right. who could have been the most god-awful people on the planet, but thankfully they've been nothing but angels the right. entire time. Okay. They have devoted their time since she came in the bar to make sure that this traumatic experience mm -hmm. does not become a severely traumatic experience. Yes, sir. Okay? Yes, sir. So this is what we're trying to figure out right now is just what happened. Mm -hmm. Because like we've been telling you, we've been searching for you for six hours. Right. I mean, because even before we got through, we got brought into all this, they've been trying to blow up your phone and get in contact with you at least an hour or so before they even called us. Right. Right? Okay. So, this is a very serious situation. Yes, sir. Okay? So, obviously, you know, if something, if you were the victim of something, obviously we will address that and go forward from there. Right. However, right now, your daughter, in a way, is also victimized. Because oh, she was, absolutely. Because she was, she was left here right. to own devices in a car that had not clearly been running for right. a long time. Which luckily it's the middle of the night, because it was the middle of the day she Yes sir. Okay. So you may be, may have been sober from those hard drugs five years ago or I guess January. Yes, sir. Alcohol doesn't it, it's not right. that much different. Okay? okay. Because I I have my brother who heroin addict for twenty years. He would drink, he'd still smoke weed, fall back right back into it every time. Now, if you're one of the few that don't go back to it, again, alcohol is just another another avenue. Right. Okay? So this, this is a very serious situation. Yes, sir. All right. Um, <clears throat> not only could I mean, like you said, the people in there were nice. Right. Had they not been nice, 
Some of you have been like, you know what, I'm going to help you find your mom. Come get in my car. Let's right. go. You know what? Uh-huh. Then you never see your daughter again. Okay. Probably sold on a black market, become a, 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 a whore, or a freaking, you know, a slave right. or something. Yeah. You know, or dead. Okay. We could have just found her in that ditch down there. We were looking for you. You know, honesty goes a long way. Listen, if you're 100% clear, like you know, you know, I just hooked a guy up yesterday, you know, who was honest with me and said, you know what, I got some heroin here, I got some box in here, I got I some needles here, funny. right? So I took care of him. Guess what? He went to jail, but he, he didn't get pounded like he could have got pounded because he was honest. You're facing possible charges of child neglect, child endangerment. I All, I'm, there's a lot of stuff that will take her away from you. Exactly. Yeah, so you won't see her anymore. I, 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 I mean, her, her, her dad was murdered last year. You know, and, and it had a huge effect on me. You know what I mean? Um, and I, I wish tonight was different. And I'm sorry to hear that he was murdered, but she's got to be your priority. Absolutely. You're absolutely right. I'm going to do the same way again. But, you know, it's not going to change the events of tonight. Right. Yeah. Okay. The reason you're wearing long sleeves? Um, it's because it's cold tonight. When was the last time you used? Um, the last time we used it was January. Do you mind rolling up your sleeves? No, sir. Wait, Sure. Okay. Is there any particular reason why you left your daughter and did not bring your phone with you? Um, I just wanted to go see a friend real quick, honestly, and then it it, it turned into me being inebriated and not being able to function. All right, before we go any further, yes, sir. I do this with everybody because when we ask questions and stuff like that, okay? Doesn't necessarily mean you're going to jail, doesn't necessarily mean that, but okay. I just want to you're show you your rights, okay? So you have the right to remain silent, and anything you say may right. be used as you as evidence against you. We have the right to talk to an attorney and have him or her present with you now or at any time during questioning. If you cannot afford an attorney, one will be appointed to represent you. <laughs> if at any time you wish to stop talking or have an attorney present, all questioning will be stopped at your request. Do you understand these rights? Yes, sir. All right. With these rights, um, with these rights in mind, do you want to keep talking to us? Of course. Okay. Thank you. I just, I mean, this is. It's for your protection and all. So it's just to, you know, just to protect you and your rights. Because if we ask you questions, you lie. And now you just put it for you. Right. Okay. If we ask you questions and you tell us something that leads us to see that you're a victim of something. Which is what I was trying to allude to earlier when I was asking those questions to see if maybe you are a victim right. of something. You know, I mean, I've never, if somebody drugged you or something like that. I've never been okay. this so over three drinks. So I, I am no idea. trying to give you the benefit of the doubt. Yes, sir. All right. Because me as a parent, I have a son, and I would never in my right mind do right. anything like that. I mean, I have a so, GCF case. You know what I mean? Like, I, I would never. You know what I mean? But. I, I, I honestly, officer, I have no idea how I got to this point. Literally, you know what I mean? Like, what woke me up is girl with bright lights. You know, like, I, I, I've never been, like, I mean, all I drink was beer. I had three beers. So, I remember getting here, I remember having a beer, and then that's it. I don't know how I woke up in a car that looks like mine. I mean, it's very similar to mine. And leaving my daughter, you know, it was supposed to be just like a very brief interaction, and I was supposed to go home. And then, so I have to ask, yes, sir. not wearing any shoes, yeah. which is fine. I mean, I people flip flops. Like to go, but your flip flops are in your car, so yes, did you go into the bar with no shoes on? Uh, I mean, I had to have, um, but like I said, it's supposed to be a, a very brief interaction, and I was supposed to. I mean, I've never been in this bar. We don't know how it ended, but we don't know how it ended. But it probably would have ended with the mom being arrested. The point of this story is this: 
You do not leave a child in a car for five, for over five, ten minutes or even more than an hour. If you do so, gee, you'll be looking at a charge of child endangerment and child abandonment. Those are very serious charges. And it can be held up in a court of law. If you do all if you leave your child in a car, you're violating the law. Even in dangerous heat. But that was my nephew in a car. He would die of heat exhaustion. And I would be in jail. There's things you have to understand. As a parent, you need to be understandable because if that was my child in a car. I would not have forgiven myself for leaving a child in a car. There's no if and bar excuse. If you're gonna go see a friend for a drink, you got if you got kids, you have responsibilities. So what you need to do, if you're gonna go out and party, fine, take your child. Take your child with you to bed at bars. Find a babysitter. Find somebody who will watch your child. Don't trust a stranger to watch your child. Period. There ain't no if and but or excuse about it. This is as simple as saying, hey, I'm gonna go out and have a drink, I'm gonna go out and have a drink with a few friends, I'm gonna hire a babysitter for you, I'm not gonna leave you home alone. Wait for the babysitter to come and go to bed at a reasonable time. Stay with them. Do not leave. If babysitters out there, don't bring your boyfriend or girlfriend with them. Don't be sneaking out, don't be going to parties. You leave your child home alone, then that baby then the babysitter could be arrested. No ifs and buts. Or excuses. Or excuses to that. There is no but. And there is no I'm sorry. Every time you simply say, hey, I'm sorry. You know that it's going to happen again. You know it's going to happen again. You know, my parents always tell me, you should have thought, thought about that if you went ahead and did it. That's what they exactly told me. I'm telling you the same thing. Sorry's not going to cut it. Doesn't make up for the fact. There ain't no I'm sorry. When you're looking at possible jail time. The bottom line is this. You got kids. You got responsibilities. You leave them in a car for over an hour. You're done. You're in jail. Your child's in the foster, your child's in foster care. And you're going to be the one telling up in court saying, Hey, you know, this should never have happened. And you can be the one sitting in jail saying, I should not have stayed home. I should not have stayed home. I should not have hired a babysitter. If you had hired a babysitter, then you wouldn't be in this situation. But great thing the people at the bar were all like being helpful because they would have taken her and put her in a car. We would not be in this mess as we are in right now. But the bottom line here is this. You got responsibilities. As an adult, you got responsibilities. You decide to have a child, you've got responsibilities ahead of you. To raise your child, and you gotta turn down your and you wanna hang with your friends, fine. But you got responsibilities for your child. You leave your child home alone, that's a charge. There's no if and bar excuse. You cannot find a babysitter, fine, bring them along. But don't leave them in a car. Go in for a quickie and say, like go in for like five minutes and say, well, I gotta go. I gotta go home because I want to be. I don't want to go to jail. They say no. You'll never. No, no. You're not gonna go to jail if you leave your child in the car. Yes, I. Yes, I will. Do not believe what your friends tell you. Your friends say to you, "Well, you'll never go to jail for leaving your child in the car." Yes, you can. Look up your. Look up your state laws. You look up your state. If you look up your state laws, you'll outsmart your friends. The only friend you have is the law. The law will help you out. In every state law you look at, it can and will help you, no matter what. The bottom line here is this. It's your duty as a parent to make sure that you protect your child, period. Even if they're seven years old. Because that was me as a stranger, and I picked up my child and said, hey, it's a little for your mom. I would have drove her off, sold her on the black market. She became a horror prostitute, and they found her in a ditch, and I'd be arrested for all that stuff. They found out who I am. I'll be arrested. I will never forgive myself. That's the bottom line. That's Game Break for this Monday going to Tuesday. We'll see you again Game Break Wednesday. And I'm sorry for not going on Saturday. I forgot it was Saturday. So I'm really sorry. Probably do a makeup tomorrow. If not, we'll do it. If not, we'll just do a regular schedule. Have a good night. No jaywalking.